Okay, good morning, everybody. It's, uh, for once, it's really nice that there's a small group of people. I'm used to giving talks at different forums, so um, I'm glad that we've got this more family-like setting. And uh, I don't know, I know just a little bit about IPv6, uh, but in fairness, I've been, as um, some of you may have heard me talk with Eric, um, it's actually now 10 years. I remember in 2009, when at that point I was still a junior systems engineer in Cisco in the Czech Republic at the time. And my boss told me, you need to pick up IPv6 because uh, none of the older engineers wanted to do it. And I worked with university customers and Czech NREN, Cessnet, and uh, they were all trying to deploy IPv6 Cisco products beyond some um, routing and switching were not doing good. And I remember terrifying first presentation in front of 500 people from Cisco Networking Academy. They had an annual conference and I had to talk about IPv6. It was totally scary. But I think they were scared even more than me because nobody asked any questions. So um, I guess today's not gonna be the case. So today I'm here on behalf of Microsoft Core Services Engineering and Operations which in other organizations is called IT. We rebranded about 18 months ago, but um, I have to put it there because this is the official title of the uh, larger organization that I'm part of. And I specifically work as a network architect in uh, cloud and connectivity engineering, which again can be easily translated to network infrastructure services. I've been with Microsoft now uh, over two years and uh, I was, um, I started this role to help them uh, move on with IPv6. So let's have a look at what we are going to cover. We've got about an hour. Uh, I've got slides that can uh, obviously use the time because you can just talk about this like for days. But uh, of course, if you've got a quest of questions, I would say I know a little bit about IPv6. Let's see. I, I'm sure you guys are like, uh, you know, all the RFCs and everything. And I'm, I'm not always uh, totally fluent in that but I know what we are doing and why we are doing it. First, let's talk a little bit about the network and when we are with dual stack today, because for us that's been a business and as usual for a while. Why do we need to do IPv6 only? Because this is still a very new concept, right? In general, um, people are getting scared when you already mentioned enabling IPv6 alongside I, uh, IPv4, while we are pushing the envelope further. So why do we need to do this? Then I would like to give you an overview of of the major activities because I hope that throughout the talk you will see we've got so much work. It's, uh, yeah, um, after a year I was in the job, my then boss, he's like, we are never gonna get this done. I was like, yeah, you realize it's only now? Well, um, it's a lot of work, but uh, this is about uh, taking it step by step and making some progress. Obviously this conference is focused on security, so I included a few slides about the uh, considerations that we have to uh, take into account and it's always about the proactive work with the vendors etc and mostly lessons learned from our uh, ongoing IPv6 only efforts and the v6 uh, work in general. So Microsoft everybody knows the brand and I last night it dawned on me when I was here for the German night and I was talking with a few people that this is a super brave step from Eno to invite somebody from Microsoft because Microsoft, that's the company that everybody, uh, the products with most vulnerabilities, you know, most issues. And I, um, yeah, there is a bittersweet feeling when I think back about, uh, about Windows in mid 2000 or early 90s or like mid 90s. So um, yeah, I think this is brave that you invited us here, but hopefully we can help move the industry a little bit. We have almost 800 locations around the world. Um, we've got four regions that are where there are some large campuses and uh, smaller campuses. The main one where we have over 100 buildings is in uh, Puget Sound, which is uh, around Redmond, Seattle in the state of Washington. So it's the northwest of the US. Um, then the rest of the region and um, North America actually includes South America we've got EMER and uh, also Asia Pacific. We've got the services uh, de deployed in on-premise data centers and of course in Azure Cloud. There is a huge um, strategic initiative that's been already going on for years uh, that we are moving all enterprise services that all our employees are using from on-premise to uh, Azure locations. And uh, we have rationalized from something like 11 to down to four. 
So you can see we are reducing that and there will probably always be some services, uh, some high risk environments uh, where which we will have to keep um, on prem, which we will not be able to put in the cloud. But uh, we are actually trying to really, there is a strong push towards the internal adoption of cloud. So if you are thinking about in your organization, we are eating our dog food, we are doing it as well. And uh, obviously our branches, they have got uh, MPLS connectivity. Today we are really doing, we are sending all the internet traffic through 11 dedicated internet edges. However, there is another strategic initiative where we are working towards having local internet breakouts, especially in locations, remote locations like Africa, South America, and in Asia Pacific, where the traffic takes a really long route to get to the internet edges. So um, this is all changing as I'm speaking. Then um, when it comes to the number of employees, about 113, 115,000 full-time employees, but then we, and we count uh, the vendors or red badges, they are, we are talking about 220, 230,000 end users. We also, as IT organization, manage somewhere between 1,400 and 1,700 a line of business applications. Those are applications that really make the business tick. So when people are placing orders for licensing, etc., this is what uh, supports uh, Microsoft. We see about 1.2 million devices connecting to the network daily. You need to bear in mind we've got quite a few servers, including virtualized, etc., and we see about 80,000 DNS requests per second. Just to give you the idea about the scale. And I want to say here one thing, which I probably should have mentioned at the beginning. I'm from IT, okay? So I'm in the same boat as all the Microsoft customers because I'm not from a product group, I'm not from Windows, uh, I'm not from Office, I'm not from Azure. They are all my partner. So if you've got complaints about some uh, functionality, especially IPv6, I, we've got internal working group uh, where we are basically trying to push the envelope when it comes to fixing problems or actually supporting features that customers and we need. I'm more than happy to take that because uh, this is really what matters. You know, when there is a customer voice behind the feature requests, as, as with every vendor, that's what makes the change. But don't give me grief about something that is not supported today. We can, we can work on it and change it together. So let's have a quick look at the dual stack, where we are and how it actually started. So some people might be surprised that already in 2001, so only something about, what was it, like three years after, uh, when was actually V6 uh, standardized? 1990? Yeah, uh, 89, and okay, 98, 1998? 98. 98. Yeah. It's, you said it the German way, right? 98. 98. 98. Yeah. So very, very soon after the protocol was actually standardized, uh, Microsoft Research started looking into this because they realized uh, this will be needed in the future. Well, everybody w knew at the time that V4 was going to run out already, um, but we've heard it sorry, for a very long time. However, they started looking into this and they basically connected, uh, enabled the first connectivity uh, between, between the various research uh, locations through ISATAP. First, that was uh, enabled on Windows servers. Eventually, they moved to Cisco 7200s. So they had a, a router that was actually uh, connecting those various locations. In 2006, they actually started to deploy it more, uh, both dual stack in small, uh, just for the de developers in, the, in those locations like India, China, and in Redmond, that is the main campus. And they were using the mixture of having ISATAP and the native connectivity. What I think is really important, at least that was for me when I started in this team, is that already in 2006, that is the year when they created the first IPv6 addressing architecture document. And interesting enough, they wrote it so well at the time, that even though we had to do a few changes uh, in the last three years, and the most recent one was last year, uh, updated for the internet, uh, local internet breakouts, we actually don't have to, didn't have to go back and fundamentally change it. So, while your then engineering standard is gets updated and we have to we have to um, evolve it, I would say this was actually a pretty good job that the guys did at the time. However, even then they didn't manage to get the management buy-in why they should actually go and deploy IPv6 on the network for any user segments. We know that at the time also the operating systems didn't have great support. Definitely, 
it came with uh, Windows XP and Service Pack 2, and then obviously Vista, they had it natively uh, available in the EU stack. In 2011, that was a very important year because uh, not only um, um, there was, we kind of had to move our space all to Azure, so in IT, we were at the time using public IPv4 in our network, we had to readdress to private, give all the public v4 or like 97 percent of it we are still obviously using public v4 on the internet edges but we basically had to surrender it to azure so they could use it for paying customers and uh, at the time the team enabled the backbone network and uh, rolled out dual stack um, what they didn't do yet at the time they didn't enable didn't have the permission to go enable all the end user segments nobody was sure what would happen uh, because they were not sure about how the how everything was ready. But the important thing is here, and uh, the World IPv6 Day, these dates that are kind of set as milestones in the industry have huge effect because people think, oh, we want to really participate, we want to get involved. And usually when you give somebody a date, they are able to focus their energy on something. If it is like, mm, it's somewhere you should do it, that's never really, that, that never has such a good effect as having a date. So I totally uh, approve of these industry efforts. But then again, things got on hold and nothing was really um, deployed when it came to the user segments. I read the final change and the rollout happened in summer 2016, where we basically uh, pushed, it out, pushed V6 onto the user segments wireless and wired. Also for the corporate network site uh, or services that live on CorpNet, uh, in our data centers. And uh, here I've got a note about having three IPv6 prefixes. I just want to say, please don't be shy. There is plenty of IPv6. When we started in 2006, the first prefix we had was from Arin. It was 2001, um, what do we have? 110? Yeah, I think that's the, that's the one in Arin. So then we've got, then we in 2015, I think they already applied for prefix for, uh, from RIPE. And then they also got another one from uh, APNIC. And I would say it's a huge operational um, advantage because we look just at the address, we look at the prefix, and the first 32 bits are always the same. And we can easily see what we are looking at, like uh, this is something coming from uh, the APNIC region or, or the European region. We also use the RIPE prefix for the, um, for the networks in Africa. So. Um, and I would say that actually creates quite nice clarity, which nobody has with IPv4. You have got 10 slash 8, and you really, that's all you've got. Like, oh, you've got the two smaller prefixes as well. But anyway, so this was a great success. And uh, what it really helped us uh, was uh, that we finally started to see user traffic on the network. And the funny thing is, in 2016, the same story is today, and it continues to be true more uh, every day that uh, basically as soon as you provide v6 connectivity, devices connect because all the operating systems, they prefer IPv6. Windows by default prefers IPv6. The same is for Mac OS, iOS. I know that I, I have looked at it. I don't think Android have any preference. They just use whatever is there, right? Uh, so this was really good, but it didn't mean that we've got the work done. So uh, I think this is like a huge milestone that everybody's trying to achieve, but we still have lots of v4 network. Just to give you some data, so uh, you got an idea. What we see today, it's about 34% of traffic on IPv6. Those are, this is telemetry I've got from Windows 10 devices. Not all user devices that are on the network we've, uh, are Windows 10. We've got still some Windows 7. We've got lots of different servers on the network as well. Plus, the, um, we've got dependency on Azure Express route. Uh, some people might have heard of it. This is kind of like if you want to have a better performance to Azure, you basically set up a private connectivity with them. You can, some service providers offer it. Uh, usually, yeah, external companies, they get it um, from a service provider, or if you are a really large customer, you can actually set up your own peering. Today, Azure Express route on the private connectivity doesn't support IPv6. That is actually coming. Um, we've been, as an organization, asking for this for many years because we are being pushed to move your services to Azure. It's like, well, you're, we can't because you don't support IPv6. So we, are, we keep going in circles like this. Luckily, there are some large customers that are also uh, asking for this. And um, I can't really talk, uh, say much more than this is actually, we hope to see this as a deliverable this calendar year. 
So we are not that far. We are preparing to, to do testing and pilot with, uh, with our colleagues in Azure. But uh, I suspect as soon as we have private connectivity and we go and en enable the virtual networks in Azure, then we will be able to see more traffic on IPv6. Um, when it comes to internet traffic, that's uh, in line with what Alexa sees. Yes, Eric. When you say 20% is Microsoft traffic going into the internet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The 34% is mostly also inside. It's, it's a mix. I would say it's an overall mix what we see because there's a, there's a telemetry collected by my colleagues in the Windows uh, team. So this is mix, the 34% is mix of internet and internal traffic. And who thinks it's mix of data? Um, I'm not sure. I would have to ask that, how they measure it. But there is a session about Windows telemetry here this week, which is not done by Microsoft. So I'm really curious, you know, to, to hear from. Uh. But the thing is, with the, with the use of the collective account from other services, I don't, I, I don't, I wouldn't expect that. It's just this. Yeah, but this is more pressure. I would expect that they basically have the devices. Uh, well, no, I wouldn't, I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna make things up, right? Uh, I need to check. Okay, because that's something that's connected directly on this device, right? Um, okay, so just to conclude this first section, um, I hope that this is now clear for everybody that we've got a, quite a big environment, uh, quite a lot of work that needs to happen. And uh, in general, we really want to have IPv6 everywhere. So it's fine, we've got the corporate services, so what lives on the internal network and serves our users, we, want, we have that enabled. But for, there are other networks like Guest, uh, there was VPN, oh, all the IoT devices that live on our network. Um, how we manage devices, uh, and that, I mean infrastructure, network, uh, security. So all this, this environment, there's, there are many services and basically everything needs to have IPv6. We understand that for some reasons in the future we will not be able to have IPv6 only everywhere. Uh, I had recently quite an emotional discussion with uh, one director from a Windows team who was telling me about developers will need to be able to develop for the customers who will not be IPv6 only. And I said, yes, of course, I understand. We will, we will leave you a special environment, which will be dual stack. I was like, but they will not like to switch between two networks. I'm thinking, mm, tough luck, right? Because we really will need to move the uh, corporate network to v6 only. But we'll have to cater for special um, special situations like these for our developers, of course. So why are we really doing V6 only? There is one thing that, that really um, brought it you know, home was the pressure from industry. And here I am again, it's like the industry event, like World IPv6 Day. Apple 2015 announced that all the iOS applications have to work in IPv6 only environment through NAT64. To some people, it might come as a surprise. It was a surprise for me when I actually looked into this, that we've got well over 85 applications in the App Store. The number goes up and down, and I'm sure I'm not catching all of them when I just basically count them. Um, but this had really a powerful effect on our product groups, because when the application starts failing on V6O networks, for example, T-Mobile US, they are very well known that all the, all the data a network that they provide for the smartphones, they are, they are, that's V6 only. And all of a sudden people started having problems. Apple obviously doesn't tell you what is the problem, why your application is failing. They leave it to the developer to figure out what is the problem. And uh, I know that lots of people go about by creating uh, like a hotspot, V6 only hotspot on the Mac. And that's how they test because the Mac is able to do NAT64 but that often doesn't really uh, cover all the network scenarios. So we had, to, we had to start working on providing our product groups with an environment that could help them meet the industry requirements. The usual song overlapping RFC 1918, so 10 slash 8, everybody uses 10 slash 8, including Azure, and we use it. So we already have to translate between ourselves. Then uh, any acquisition we've got, think about GitHub, LinkedIn, in the past, Nokia, um, anybody new we buy today, everybody is using the same 10 slash 8 space. And it's truly painful. Um, some of them are ready that they would be able to connect us on IPv6, like LinkedIn, 
they wanted to have E6 connectivity straight away. Unfortunately, not our like HR system and everything today is not enabled with IPv6, so we couldn't do this. Again, another layer of NAT that we needed to use. Then uh, in our VPN, we are again using 10 slash space um, or the part, well, we are using actually something different, but uh, it's also private IPv4, but our outsourcing partners use the 10 slash 8. And if we send them through VPN a default route to 10 slash 8, that they should send everything through VPN, we just break them, right? So we are working on something that I'm gonna talk about later. Internally, we are the IP master for the whole organization, except Azure. So any product group, even when they put their virtualized lab into Azure, they come to us and ask for uh, IP space. Well, um, they usually like some really large allocations, couple of slash 16s would be nice. Nobody wants to manage 30 small uh, prefixes or subnets. Uh, so based on that, we are currently estimating, and it's a sliding day, two to three years, because we have got also V4 reclamation uh, efforts. We want to uh, use take back space, which people took in the past, but we see like one or 2% utilization. So we tell them you can readdress with something smaller, give us the large allocation back. But anyway, we, we can foresee this is gonna happen. And then a really painful thing for us is the operational complexity of dual stack. Um, any network design review that we do with engineers, like there are questions about how many IPv4 people need for addressing access points in the buildings, right? We do constant refreshes and upgrades of buildings all over the world. We've got quite a few to do. So we, need to, we are increasing the density on access points, people bring in more devices, right? That means they need a little bit bigger signets. And that's like, do you really need 64 IPv4 addresses for access points? I'm like, if they were V6, we didn't need to even think about it. And then the usual story, V6 gets forgotten. You know, somebody updates a policy or we move to a new firewall and all of a sudden the, the rules don't get, uh, you know, transported. It's just, um, it's, it's just too difficult. And then uh, obviously I already mentioned the business impact of V4. Somebody comes to us, they want, need to move from on-prem to virtualize. They need a few hundred thousand IPv4 addresses. It's like, when they need them before they move, right? So they actually can't take what they've got today. So um, it's really slowing us down. And then uh, one thing that people also uh, need to be aware of, and this is something that helped us in turn to really drive the business case. So when, I, when, I, when they asked me, oh, why do you need to spend X number of money on NAT64 and DNS64? I was like, well, I don't have to, but we need this many addresses. And if you really want us to continue the business, you will have to give us a lot of money for these addresses. And that usually actually makes the finance people, you know, uh, understand quite quickly because this is more expensive and this is getting more and more expensive every day. I'm super grateful to this company. Uh, the name of the lady is Sandra. She, she uh, basically runs this um, market broker and uh, she's basically facilitating the transfers of IPv4 address space. And they are one of the companies that actually share public information about how the price is going up. So what I've got at the top, our in exhaustion, when was it? It was 2015, right? I think something early. So ENI was 2011, and then quickly there was APNIC and RIPE after that. And then ARIN uh, followed, and they've got different policy. They just went straight to the, uh, to the bottom. They've got very small space. Everybody else is kind of like conserving. You can get little small space, one more. So they are not exhausting as quickly, but they run out. And you see, before they run out, the price for slash 16, an IP address in it was $7. The price today, I looked at it last week, is over $19. Uh, and, I, and that has gone up by $3.50 or $4.50 in the last year and a half. Because when I wrote internally a white paper about why we need to do V6 only, it was $14.50 per IP address. And that is uh, October 2017. Now we are in March 2019 and the price keeps creeping up. Uh, so it's very expensive if we wanted to buy. The problem is, is there good enough space to buy? Because I know my colleagues in Azure are obviously looking into this. Everybody who needs to, who needs to have public connectivity. Some companies just go and buy some smaller blocks to continue having peering in uh, different locations around the world because they just basically at least need to have V4 on the peering. Um, the problem is that what is available today on the market is not good enough. It has got bad reputation, comes from countries that might turn up on, on some bad list. And the databases don't always get 
everybody who uses reputation or keeps the reputation, they don't always update the information in time when these transfers happen. So it can easily happen that a totally innocent user on some uh, um, well-known and uh, trusted broadband provider gets, for example, their US visa application declined simply because the IPv4 address that they saw the application coming from is registered in Libya. And that's a, that's a story that one of our friends shared with me. Um, but um, it's just uh, really shocking that really you can be, be impacted. So where are we with IPv6 and IPv6 only? And I actually keep updating these slides, slides because we just keep changing things and deploying more. Before I get to this, is everybody familiar with how V6 speaks to V4? V6 only speaks to V4. See some nods. Okay, no, not everybody's nodding, so I run through this quickly. Basically, today still 73% of internet is V6, V4 only. This is based on Google statistics that they publish, which are absolutely awesome. So, of course, for us, as you saw the data before, we've got V4 only applications on our internal network. So, in order to make sure we don't dis disconnect our users from the rest of the world and the rest of the organization, we need to deploy something called NAT64 DNS64. It works really simply. And I am really taking, a, uh, have a go here at our own company, at GitHub, that we acquired recently, because uh, I have learned that uh, I have previously had the UK government, uh, the, because they were V4 only, and a few months ago, uh, their CDN provider enabled IPv6 for them. So they are good. Then I had Bing, and Bing, uh, about a few weeks ago, completed the uh, dual stack rollout globally. So, okay, so which other, which other company well-known or site is V4 only? So today it's GitHub. Hopefully they will enable V6 soon too. But it works really simply and DNS uh, really helps here, does the magic. Client sends a DNS request for the website and uh, on the network it's configured that it actually sends, uh, this information is sent to DNS64. This is shared by the, uh, when the client joins the network, it gets the DNS information in the router advertisements. Then basically the response come back, but it's IPv4 only, unfortunately. However, now the magic happens. DNS64 has pre-configured IPv6 prefix, which is corresponding with the NAT64 and synthesizes the v4 address of the website with the IPv6 prefix, which is pre-configured, and sends a full IPv6 address to the client. The client then says, okay, hooray, um, I can talk to this uh, server because it speaks IPv6. The network does the normal magic, routes the traffic to the NAT64 uh, gateway. Then uh, the gateway uh, does a simple uh, operation where it extracts the IPv4 address of github.com. And uh, obviously there is a state on the NAT64 and then sends, the, sends it back uh, onto the V4 internet through the network. It's really simple and it's really powerful. Um, and by the way, I didn't include here a slide on uh, how V6 only looks like because all of you, if you are connected, connected to Troopers, that is V6 only network. So if you look on your device, you will be able to see what V6 only looks like. So we've got many ongoing activities and I'm going to focus on, on those where we've got uh, quite a lot going on and we are making some good progress because there are many others which are in their infancy and we really don't have time to cover that. So I will talk about wireless uh, guest network because there is an important lesson to be learned and uh, we learned it about two years ago. Then uh, what we are, how we supported our product groups uh, in all, to be able to develop and test on V6 only, what we've done with our VPN. And finally, this is uh, the biggest effort we've got is the V6 only corporate network. So um, this was probably the first V6 only story many people in industry actually heard a few years ago, when my uh, then colleague uh, actually presented about their idea and what we were trying to test was to do wireless network for our guests that come on to Microsoft campuses and offices and turn it into V6 only. The problem is um, that basically they didn't catch a major problem with the VPN because um, thanks to a conference, um, not, not that it's similar to this one, but Facebook, they run a, um, Facebook at scale at, uh, in California, and some people might have heard the name of Paul Saab. He's a big advocate of IPv6, and he was a big driving force behind IPv6 enablement in Facebook. They offered a wireless network as V6 only for the uh, event attendees. 
And there my colleague attended from the architecture team and say, hey, about 598 people in the room couldn't connect their VPN on V6 only. May only two could, and one of them was from Cisco because Cisco any connect works on V6 only. And I think the other one was using Pulse VPN from Juniper, or they are not Juniper anymore, but um, that's what they were. So we actually realized that not all VPN clients, especially if they are IPsec based, they can um, they can work through NAT64. Um, and this program, like this, was like three months after I started this job. And they've been testing it for the, la for the nine months. And then I had to say, okay, we have to stop it. It was pretty much heartbreaking because uh, we presented about it. And I actually had to stop the project like a week after I spoke about it in California. So it was, li it was like, well, that's IPv6 for you because it can really happen that you hit a major issue. And for me as a network operator, user experience is absolutely central and essential. So even though I would love to go and do it, we couldn't really afford to uh, impact our visitors in such a bad way. The good news is though that when our visitors will have their VPN concentrators enabled with IPv6, then basically the session will set up over v6 and it will avoid any translation. So we will have to see. Uh, right now we are in process of uh, rolling our dual stack for the wireless network globally, guest network. And we are thinking, obviously, like there's so much work we've got, but we would like to run screen tests, which is in selected locations. Imagine like our IT buildings, where we are mostly based. We would go and disable V4 on the guest and see what really breaks and who really complains. Obviously, this will have to be very well communicated. Um, I think beyond technology, like communication and the human side is probably 75% of the work. But we are definitely not giving up of the idea of V6 only guest. Then how did we solve the, the requirement for our product groups? We, they basically came and said it was specifically Skype, Minecraft. They had big concerns and they also had uh, some negative feedback from users about their applications on V6 only networks. And they said, well, we need to test. So we provide them what you've got guys here. Uh, that's the pure internet connectivity, no access to the corporate resources with NAT64 and it has got a pre-shared key, which is rotated automatically every, every couple of weeks. And really, we want, we, that's created an environment which is very similar to what people have at home um, if, you, if you had V6 only uh, from your uh, broadband provider. This helps with the uh, industry and regulatory requ requirements. So Apple, I already mentioned, US federal government, there is again some energy um, starting uh, there is some renewal in, 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 there, in that space for V6. And recently, our home state of Washington actually announced that by the end of 2024 or 2025, they will retire V4 from all their services. So they actually set a date. And for all the agencies and all the, all the services that they, they are consuming internally and also in the cloud, they are a big customer of Office 365. So this is a really big impact uh, on us as a, as a vendor. It will have impact on any vendor. Um, so we really have now an environment that, where we can test and make sure stuff works. One thing which was a problem and we really couldn't deliver it for Android platforms immediately because we didn't have uh, RENS support in, our, uh, in the code of our building routers. So I believe you guys are all aware, but to my surprise, many people aren't. Well, I wasn't at the beginning either. Uh, Android doesn't support the v 6 so it supports RDNSS or option 25. <laughs> and uh, basically, we needed to make sure that our routers were able to um, send DNS information in router advertisements, um, which wasn't the case. But now we've got the code and we are, uh, we've had the code for a year and a half, so we are in, in process of upgrading. Uh, currently, we've got this network deployed in 12 locations. It really depends on where, whether the product groups are using it, or need it, and uh, use it. We also look at the utilization, and if it's not used, we actually go and stop broadcasting the network in a location. So this is something which is great. You know, I'm really pleased with it, and our engineers are actually okay. Yeah, this is a business as usual. We check routing. If, it, if stuff is there, is there code? We just deploy it. You know, it can be done within a within a month uh, when they come to us with a request. Then uh, remote access VPN. So um, we deployed a new environment, a new VPN vendor um, in uh, early 2018. 
and we basically have now it enabled for over 200,000 users. Uh, important is that in, on the inside, inside the tunnel, it's dual stack. But um, we, uh, well, I'll get to that. The VPN concentrators today respond only with V4. Well, it's the load balancing solution before them that responds V4. The concentrators are dual stack as well. We are just waiting for, for the um, uh, solution to be able to perform health checking to make sure that basically it doesn't respond with V6. And for example, the, the concentrator that had that address is actually dead, right? So all of a sudden the clients uh, are not able to connect to the address that was sent back by the, by the gateway. Uh, so we are, we are just working with, um, uh, with the vendor to give us that capability. As soon as it's an, uh, an available, then we are able to have the tunnel set up on both V4 and V6. However, I already mentioned, I think it's clear that VPN consumes a lot of IPv4. Even though we worked around in some way, we are doing another NAT uh, in, the VP, uh, in the VPN. So it's good fun. But what we want to do, um, especially uh, in order to avoid the clashes with 10 slash 8 space that our partners use, we want to do V6 only inside. So in uh, late 2017, we started a proof of concept where we wanted to have inside the tunnel only IPv6 and nothing else. Uh, on the outside the tunnel, the transport can be set up on both V4 and V6, but what we control the addressing that we allocate, that would be V6 only. And we don't send all traffic through the RVPN. We perform spittling so the internet doesn't get impacted by this. Um, yeah. So there is some work in progress. You might actually think why should, do, we, do people really need to enable uh, VPN for uh, both V4 and V6? So not only because of these events where uh, it's lovely to have V6-only network, and I'm pleased that even though um, our uh, VPN concentrators respond only with V4, actually uh, Palo Alto, I said it, they have done a fix. They actually uh, fix things, and um, our VPN actually connects on V6-only, even through NAS64. So I'm really pleased with that, to see that, that uh, we don't have the dependency anymore. So the internet is changing. I have here a few dates, 2016, uh, when this is when we rolled out dual stack, that's where the internet was, 12% of user traffic on the internet was on IPv6. This is, I'm so happy that it finally got to 27%. It's been trying to get there since January. So uh, as of uh, two weeks ago, basically, in, uh, Google measured that user traffic reached 27%. Uh, there is the problem, uh, we see that the enterprises are not as fast in deploying IPv6. Uh, but what is concerning me much more is that service providers are moving to IPv4 as a service. They're taking their uh, networks that carry user traffic, turning them to v6 only. They're still able to provide v4 at home. They provide you both v4 and v6, but v4 is um, treated as a second class citizen on the internet. So the only defense for an enterprise really for any changes to networks that are totally out of their control, which are the service provider networks, and they will not ask for anybody's permission, the only defense is to enable v6 for all the public services. Now, finally, I'm getting on to the pilot. So when we had kind of the situation with the guests and we realized we couldn't do v6 only there, which would again enable us reclaim quite large IPv4 space, we said, well, let's start working on, on the corpnet and let's see how that goes. Um, we started in April last year. And as of today, we've got 12 locations. I think, or at least the plan is that sometime in, by summer, we will have uh, probably 20 locations. And we are not going like, uh, this is not where people just get before removed in the locations. The network is parallel to the normal dual stack wireless network, because uh, we want to make sure that uh, if and when stuff doesn't work on v6 only, that people are, can switch back and they can continue working on dual stack. And trust me, that happens a lot. Uh, we also used wireless simply because uh, there's a higher barrier of entrance. So people have to have managed devices, even my, even my phone uh, has, to have be, has to be managed. So not everybody can connect to our wireless while um, to the wired people can plug IoT devices, there, there, is, there are dependencies on the physical security, uh, imagine like uh, all the uh, fire alarms, building management system, everything. 
and I'll, men I'll talk about it a little bit later, um, their like IP and IPv6 support is uh, highly questionable, so we really couldn't impact that. So that's why we are really focusing first on the wireless. Obviously, to continue the rollout, we need to be able to have uh, NAT64, DNS64 function in the network in the regions because I can't be sending people from Africa through NAT64 in, in uh, Northwest US, right, in Seattle. So we, we are today in the US and in EMEA here in Europe, and we are currently building out in Asia Pacific. This fiscal year, we are planning to finish uh, the East, End, East Coast and the Bay Area in the US because US is quite a large geography. So we are, we are working on that. And then the next, uh, next, next year, for us that starts in July, uh, we are looking at the rest of the world. From the network perspective, uh, we actually had, uh, there was a really big surprise for me because uh, the test network was re working really well. So before we started this CorpNet pilot, the test network for developers has been in place for a year and we never had any issues on it. But uh, we then realized that if uh, they test mostly smart devices like smartphones, those devices don't have persistent connectivity. You know, you, you connect, you check your Instagram, whatever, your Facebook, send a couple of messages, and then your device goes to sleep and it connects again. While on, on a desktop or laptop, basically uh, the user expects to have permanent connectivity, which is kind of normal. That's what networks are supposed to do. And uh, like, for example, calls can end if you don't have any internet connectivity. And all of a sudden, very soon we started, we started getting reports that people were getting no internet. All of a sudden, they didn't have any DNS information. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, we are sending it, so why are the devices not getting it? it took us a little while, um, found a bug. One was, uh, so we are using two vendors for a wireless, um, they are about 50-50. Uh, so one is Aruba, the other one is Cisco. And it was really fascinating that both had similar problem. The, the bugs were different, but the impact on user was exactly the same. So uh, Aruba, they basically were dropping the router advertisement messages, which obviously carried the DNS information. And uh, then uh, uh, the Cisco uh, controllers, they basically started to deauthenticate de -authenticate clients every now and then. And the funny part is that the bugs were obviously on dual stack as well, but we couldn't see it because uh, V4 kept everybody connected. And actually it came to me, this is why these events are so important again, um, I, I chair UK IPv6 Council and I was chatting with the guys there. Uh, one of them is from Imp uh, Imperial College London and he was saying me, we are seeing this weird thing on dual stack that people basically are losing IPv6. So I started looking into this and, and found that there, actually there was a bug. Um, for us, the lesson learned was that we really need to proactively be getting IPv6 bug scrubs from our, from our vendors and uh, dual stack is still not good enough for testing re real IPv6. If you want to see what doesn't work, even just from the network perspective, you really need to test with IPv6 only. There is more, but I've got the whole section of lessons learned. So right now, I'm really pleased to say that we've got a pretty stable network environment. The user experience is consistent, but we are actually, there are other things that we are constantly uncovering. Uh, Biggest concern here though is uh, are the applications. This is why we are running the pilot. This is why we are, for example, not setting any date on the end of the pilot and when we move to the production. This will have to be broadly agreed with lots of different groups. First of all, with my management and mostly the engineers. Like we want to be 100% comfortable that we don't impact user experience once we remove V4 from the production network, right? So. The network, yeah, you, we are hitting bugs, we are hitting different various little glitches, etc. But actually, this is about the applications. Um, and again, as a reminder, our environment is quite big. So what we are working towards is to have all internal services enabled with IPv6, not just the ones on corporate, but whatever environment is on-prem and in Azure in the cloud. So we avoid sending as much traffic as uh, we avoid sending as much traffic as possible through the NAT64. Because uh, you can imagine we've got uh, lots of connectivity that flows to Azure, lots of traffic that is being sent, generated by our developers. We def I definitely don't want to spend millions of dollars on a, a large um, carrier-grade NAT64. So, 
that was kind of the update about where we are with uh, with the IPv6 and IPv6 only. Those were four big efforts. There's obviously lots more going on. Uh, but let's have a look at the security. So this is my favorite topic in the sense that uh, everybody comes in, uh, the security people, and especially IPv6 security people, and start painting a really bleak picture. And my, like any security, IPv6 security presentation, listen to like comparing the v4 and v6, you know, how complicated it is, the extension had a blah, 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 like, well, this computer's for you, right? Nothing is really simple. And if people are not that happy with things, then they could just sh should go and try to change the standards, you know. I know it's not easy, but uh, I said, we'll just have to get on with it. And as a network operator, we have to deploy. So we have to use what is out there. Luckily, there are lots of smart people, some of them sitting here in the room, who contributed to some of the IPv6 security uh, techniques, which is really great. So we, have, uh, we are network people, and then there is an inf information security team organization that we work really closely with. They are the ones who write the control procedures and security standards. Um, now, right now, the important thing is that all of these must include IPv6. And we are in process of making sure that this is really happening. They already have it, but we just want to make sure that it's consistent everywhere. Because um, based on my experience, never assume that it is everywhere, rather go and check. So all the policy enforcement is then done by our team, obviously like the firewall rules on access list, infrastructure access list, etc., BGP peering sessions, whatever you whatever you actually think of as a network security, we are we have it deployed. When it comes to infrastructure security on the end user segments, obviously the IPv6 first op security that is deployed both on our wireless and wired, uh, very important, and this is something that. Uh, especially like junior engineers need to remember that they don't block ICMP version 6 by access lists because that behaves slightly differently than v4. Uh, our internet edge and data center firewalls are enabled for, for the corpnet traffic to inspect IPv6. And we also are, have deployed wired port security and that obviously again has to support both v4 and v6. We've got some, uh, some small shortcomings there, but working actively with the vendor to get it fixed. Then um, cloud security solution, I, manage, I mentioned the um, internet, local internet breakouts that we want to deliver. There, this is where we also like constantly, this is the sad part, right? Because the enterprises are lagging behind in IPv6 deployment. They are not asking the vendors to support it in the enterprise solutions. So the, the usual routing, switching, wireless, you've got all the good stuff. But for some physical security, like firewalls, they are in good shape. VPNs, they are getting there, right? But as soon as it goes to a cloud solution or something which is slightly non-traditional, oh, we don't know about IPv6. So my answer to them or a message that I send through the different teams, like if they don't support v6 in their cloud security solution, they're securing only 73% of the internet. What are you going to do about the remaining 27? Right, you are not securing us enough. Uh, and funny enough, how oh, we have to, we are actually run a uh, IPv6 readiness effort. We are currently running it, and basically there is engagement with all the vendors and asking them uh, v6, but v6 only. Right. So where are you there? And there sometimes, of course, we support v6. Uh, I'm not so sure about v6 only. So when it comes to security, is the, again the same set of questions. Um, then there are things that we are currently discussing with the security team. For example, um, correlation of IPv6 events, but IPv6 only, so they will not have the clutch of uh, IPv4 there, uh, because this actually can have really impact on the forensics. Uh, is it capable of doing this? Then uh, the device personal firewall, can it function in v6 only environment? Can it download the updates over v6 only? You know, can it scan? Does it have any dependency on what type of network connectivity the device has? Also, ATP has to be able to support both v6 and v4. And there is like the security tools supporting that environment, but also is it possible to manage them over v6 only? Is it possible to access them from v6 only segments? So there are like multiple angles that we are looking at this uh, and Basically, this is something that has to be, the work has to be completed, but this is a work actively in, pro, uh, in process. Then thinking about the v6 only user environment, like privacy IPv6 addresses, you know, and how many addresses a device can generate, how often does it change, you know, 
how does it impact the forensic? So if, if, the, if I move from one building to another, my, I, I'm going to get a different V6P fix simply because I'm in different location in a different VLAN, right? It has still, it's still allocated from within the addressing um, hierarchy, but I all of a sudden have a different address. So what, what do we actually need to um, you know, investigate? How do they investigate? How do they get information? How they correlate it? We don't use stateful DHCP v6. Uh, we are using stateless DHCP v6 and RDNSS. And we simply have to because we don't know what device is going to turn up on the network. And um, well, on the corpnet we somehow know, but like, like the guest network and the, and the wired, uh, like for example, IoT devices, mm, they never heard of the RDNSS, right? They need the v 6 but we can talk about it later. Auditing the applications that they don't use before only calls. And this is not just security application, that's any application. And we have come across this recently. Uh, it's it's going to be a huge effort uh, to get this verified. The important thing here is we work really closely with our information security team, and this is this it's not a network team that can do this all on our own. We really have to work across the organization. So I've got about seven minutes left, but uh, let's go through the lessons learned and uh, what we have learned. So I mentioned V6 only proof of concept and I managed to say who our vendor is on record, but uh, it's good, they are doing a fantastic job. So even though uh, during the POC 18 mo 15 months ago, we found that they were not able to support V6 only client pool. So basically assign the clients, VPN clients only IPv6 inside the tunnel. Uh, but uh, here it's very important to engage with the vendors. Not, don't expect that they have moral duty to support your feature, right? Unless there are money behind those feature requests, um, basically, sorry, I worked for a vendor for 10 years, they don't care. It's a simple story as that and people somehow can't get over it, but that's as it is. But because we are really significant customer for Halato and they are a great team, they uh, actually delivered us beta code for testing. So we had, we had the testing 20, uh, late 2017 and they admitted in March last year. I wasn't very happy. I think my happiness, I showed it a little bit. And uh, that uh, had a positive effect in that, that actually they were able to get, give us a beta code to test V6 only uh, VPN uh, already in October last year. And as of now, for the last, I would say six weeks, we already have a production code that we are actively testing. And the first, uh, first tests are showing that everything works as we, as we need it. So I would just say the vendor engagement is super important. Now you say, okay, hooray, you've got the code now, go and deploy. Well, first of all, we need to have the NAT64, DNA64 everywhere, also close to our VPN gateways. And they are not always where our internet edges or our data centers are. There, there's few more locations that we need to think about. Prior to that, we really need to go through a proper uh, phase of user acceptance testing, where we are building out the environment and we want to get few hundred users, not just us, the, the IPv6 team, you know, the, the crazy guys, on the pilot, we want some uh, like norm people who are not really touched by IPv6 and they even shouldn't be. And we want them to, to be able to uh, actually test and make sure that we are not missing any trick. We also hope that this will help us to weed out the um, applications that st are still on CorpNet, which are not enabled on IPv6, which uh, basically this is what people use. I actually use VPN only to access CorpNet. Like most of my work I can do without connecting to VPN ever because everything lives in the cloud. But um, here we are, we are going to basically progress and uh, we'll see how this goes. Then wireless guest and IPv6. We also found out that uh, one of our vendors actually doesn't support uh, radio authentication of, over IPv6. It's, uh, it's not really a problem when the, when the guest is wireless, but if we want to have the whole environment enabled with IPv6 and everything end to end, Again, feature request with the vendor. Um, we looked. Uh, we are looking actively at infrastructure management, and we first started looking at wireless infrastructure management because, as I said, like why should be APs addressed with IPv4? The CAPFAP tunnel or GRE tunnel can be easily set up over IPv6. The traffic inside it can still be both v4 and v6 or whatever, right? But uh, we actually found out that one of the vendors didn't in the current version of co uh, code that we've got didn't support APs dynamically looking up the controllers. 
So now we are testing uh, the next train and because it's, uh, it's going to be a, a quite impactful change in the architecture, it is going to take some time. But the testing is going on as we speak. Um, this was very, I already mentioned the cloud security providers, but I was very pleased that thanks to our Internet First initiative, that's the inter local internet breakouts, uh, Cisco Umbrella today supports not only uh, Corday records, but also inspecting DNS traffic, uh, the V6 traffic, sorry. IoT devices, um, reality check, most of them run on Android, right? And Android doesn't support the HCPv6. Those are the new ones. So really the network has to support it even if we said, oh, we want, we are enterprise and we are going to do only the HCPv6. The old IoT, that's even a harsher reality because they often expect uh, static addresses, they expect uh, sprawling layer two segments so they can access the central uh, controllers. And uh, they are quite important, really critical, like uh, your system, systems that pressurize this building, maintain the airflow in this building. Uh, you, it can have funny consequences if, if those lose sight of the central management. Um, it's not a good result for the building, I can tell you that. Uh, then uh, the wired port security, basically, uh, we don't need it only in the solution, which is doing, uh, which is performing the security and uh, selective isolation, but we also need support in the switch code because that's where uh, the devices are connecting. So again, testing as we speak. We have to go through the whole network and all the infrastructure and really audit, is the hardware capable is, is the code capable of supporting all the V6 features that we need? Uh, it's part of the device lifecycle management. It shouldn't be like a big bang thing, but once it's included, the V6 is included there, and those questions are asked, it makes it easier later. Um, and also the dependencies. It's not just about the network, because the services might live in a different environment, like for us, they live in Azure. There is a dependency on the connectivity on, on the virtual network supporting IPv6. So it's all like little domino effect or puzzle, if you like. Uh, it's really important to know that because there can be lots of surprises. Monitoring solution. Fun fact, uh, my organization, I wasn't involved, acquired a monitoring solution to monitor user experience. And uh, only when, uh, when everything was signed off and one of my colleagues got involved and he asked the question about monitoring V6 traffic, everybody was like, IPv6 what? I was like, are you serious? 2018. I'm here for a year and a half, and you are telling me you haven't asked the question. So we found out it can support it, but we'll need to spend extra money. Um, actually, I'm talking about it tonight uh, with my team. Um, I mentioned addressing plan. Uh, lots of people are really want to get it done perfectly first time. You will have to iterate. It will have to change and adopt. It's a normal thing, so don't get too precious about it. And also don't try to make it perfect. Iteration, that's the that's the new way how to get things done and progress. I mentioned applications. You have to in, we have to engage with our own internal developers, which is already um, fun, but uh, there are the, always is good to have some allies who can help you with those conversations. And of course, then a third party, because we are using about 40,000 third party applications in Microsoft, not only our, our applications. So, there's, there's also like an ongoing engagement, like do you support V6 and V6 only mostly? Well, for me, I'm saying like first work in V6 only and through NAT64. You don't need to go and enable everything, your backend systems with IPv6, but the first step, make sure you don't have any V4 dependencies. Um, my experience, your own people in the team, political, carrier, whatever it might be, they don't feel that they trust you. They actually will go and block uh, those are the worst if they block you passively. Actively, at least you can work with them. Uh, with the passive, it's, it's a little bit more difficult, so you might need to try to find a way around, but it's part of the work. Getting the feedback from users. You might be surprised or not that you roll out something and you ask the users. They know they are part of pilot. They, they basically should. The, the goal is to uncover what doesn't work and what works. But getting the feedback is super hard. Like, Everybody in my organization is telling me, when we get more people on the networks, like, well, we've been running it for a year. Now tell me how many more, pe how can we get more people on the network? Because um, uh, it's, it's really hard. And also not just to get them, but to get them use the network because they still have the option to go back if stuff doesn't work. And people prefer to do their work rather than test for you, right? It's normal. 
So what we are looking at once our team is comfortable with the uh, things uh, and we are we remove some major blockers, we've got internally mostly the dependency on Azure, etc. We are thinking that hopefully towards end of this calendar year we will run some screen tests. So basically this will have to be well communicated, but in selected locations, mostly where engineering, um, our engineering organization is, Azure networking, etc we actually go and switch our v4 from the normal corpnet and we'll see for a day let's see what breaks what people uh, will report uh, i wonder whether people turn up to work or everybody decides to work remotely but let's see but what we have also done uh, and this is again this is the like the human side we have launched bug bounty so if, you, if people come to us and they report a bug we've got a like a whole process for it it's pretty simple they just need to go to a, a page report the problem that they've got and if it's a real bug, for example, it's not like somebody, oh, I didn't upgrade my laptop for six months and now it actually nothing works on your network. Well, first upgrade your laptop and then come and tell me what's broken. But if it's a real bug, they get a Starbucks card. And the same goes for IPv6 sweepstakes, where we basically encourage people to, to encourage their colleagues to join the pilot. And then they can actually put their nominations in, in, a, in, a, in a system and then they can, uh, bi-monthly, they can win a... Starbucks card. So we are trying everything we can. And I would say the most important really lesson is like, what is your mean time or our time to innocence? Mean time to innocence. Basically, you have to go and think, is it the network? Did we introduce some bug by new code? Uh, the application. There was a recent um, operating system update, right? Or drivers. We, we get like this patch, patch Tuesday. Everybody knows it about it. We get lots of updates uh, all the time. So really figuring out what is the root cause is really not straightforward, but it's something that we have to do. And I would say we are not doing it alone. A partnership across all the organizations, being the product groups, Windows, Azure, uh, within our OIT, IT organization is truly essential. This is not something that can be done only by the networking team. So to conclude my talk, I'm going to, I'm going to leave this uh, once you get the slides. Uh, there are a couple of links to blog posts that were written uh, and a podcast that I did last summer with, uh, with um, Hexabuild. There will be more uh, because the story evolves. And I would say uh, this is the true sign of intelligence is not knowledge but imagination. And this is very true, especially for IPv6. Because people often want to have all these definite answers. They want to know exactly you can't. You really just have to imagine and kind of walk towards and follow your idea to make your vision come true. Thank you.